they asked me to come talk about knowledge online and virtual knowledge and, and that kind of thing, but I don't really believe in the concept of online. There's no in real life versus, uh, you know, versus online. There's just away from a keyboard and in front of a keyboard. It's all kind of the same place. Uh, this is a, a saying that a friend at the Pirate Bay originally came up with, and uh, one of the entities that kind of came from that same community is telecomics. And they're one of the groups I want to talk about here a bit today. Telecomics was part of the internet self-defense system, I guess is, a, is one way of describing them. They were a leaderless collective. You could compare them to Anonymous if you, if you know who Anonymous is, but they were really pretty different in that they were a much more defined community and they actually had real purposes. So telecomics did a bunch of work during the Egyptian revolution, during the early phases. Um, when communications were cut off in Egypt, they found all of the fax numbers in Egypt and they faxed dial-up modem instructions to everyone in Egypt to provide ways of getting online, to provide ways of getting that kind of communication flowing. Um, they did a lot of work in Syria, again in the early phases of the revolution there, of the, well, what is now turned into the civil war there, um, trying to keep people safe, doing security training, keeping people online and connected, helping news get out. And along the way, they created a really interesting structure of community and knowledge and sharing. Um, people didn't come to telecomics kind of knowing that, oh yes, I know all of this stuff about security or whatever. Some, some people did, and then they found out how much they didn't know about the world. Um, and a lot of people just came up saying, hey, I want to help, what can I do? And in that way, it ended up being a community of sharing information that was, if you could call it a school, it was one, I would say it was one of the best schools I'd ever seen, but it really wasn't. It was a community teaching and learning together, which is maybe what school should be. Um, there's a long history of this kind of stuff online. Uh, Unix is the operating system that at this point has won. It runs the world. Basically everything except a small portion of desktops runs on some form of Unix. Unix has a very long and storied history. It grew up with the internet. The internet grew up with it, moreover. Um, and Unix's culture was always one of apprenticeship. It's where this kind of collective learning started. Now this was at the time, a ridiculously exclusive apprenticeship. You had to be technical and at an institution that had very expensive machines and very expensive connections, but there was still very little formal training. And to a degree now, there still isn't very much formal training in things like how the internet works at the core. It really is all run on apprenticeships. One of the things which is really interesting, many of these apprenticeships may be completely virtual, they may be people who never meet, but they very much model the process of some of the best offline learning. There's really, again, there's no difference between online and offline. It's born out of this kind of structure and community. Communication systems, though, are not that simple. Um, communication space is striated. It's not a smooth space. There are, there are ridges and valleys and areas of denial in there. And every technology that we create to interact with each other shapes us in the same way that we shaped that technology. There's this constant interplay back and forth. And that shaping privileges some kinds of communication. Um, systems recreate the power structures that created the systems in the first place. There's actually some really amazing design research out there looking at the degree to which this is true, the degree to which um, a system that an organization builds models the actual structure of the organization that built it. The concrete specificity of these systems is incredibly important if we want to understand what they do. Telecomics came from IRC. It came from the kind of equality of a chat room that's just chaos, that's just everyone running around and no one in charge. And it came from the ease of creating infrastructure that the open source software community has, has sort of brought into the world. It's very easy to stand up the kind of infrastructure that when you talk to people, say, in the intelligence world, they're sort of shocked. It's like, wait, but don't you need whatever they think that you need to do that? But you don't. 
on the flip side, it's imperfect. It's, it's, you know, this is the best that you can do with no money, and what you can do with no money is amazing, but there's always limits, and those limits shape things too. Telecomics ended up going into kind of permanent hibernation because they didn't have room, because they, they couldn't grow, and they couldn't continue to be the thing that they were. So I want to talk about a few pitfalls of things online, and then I'll jump to some offline stuff. Openness. Openness is potentially terrible. It can be great, but it comes with all of these caveats, all of these little asterisks. Openness for who, for what, for when. MOOCs are maybe amazing, or they're maybe the next stage of the kind of uh, precaritization of the adjunct class. You know, you can't, you can never just look at one angle of this. Knowledge is a process. You can't say that, you know, oh, we've, we, we wrote that down, it exists, especially online. Knowledge is a community that keeps it alive, that gives it context, that teaches. And one of the funny things about data is that it is much less stable than we think it is. Everything online is there forever, except until it isn't. And forever turns out to be very short, except when maybe we don't want it to, and then maybe it, you know. Um, Engagement is one of the other words that I absolutely loathe with a burning passion. Um, Facebook is not a school. Facebook is designed for engagement. It's designed for engagement for exploitation. So many of the platforms that we might want to build on, the things that are offered to us for free, mostly not the open source ones, they come with their own issues, but the things that are given to us for free are not given to us, they're, they're enticing us in. And if you want to build virtual community, you need to start from a place of community. That's not community. So I want to jump off into embodiment, because bodies change how we learn a lot. And this is the one caveat that I'll put on that. Well, it's just away from a keyboard or in front of a keyboard. That keyboard does change things a bit, um, but not always in the way that we think they do. So one of, the, uh, one of the other communities I'm involved in is the Nordic LARP community. Now, many of you, if you've heard of LARP, are thinking of people running around in the forest, hitting each other with swords. Um, the Nordic LARP community started from that, and then they moved kind of through a process of, of collectivism, saying, hey, we care about telling these stories well. What if we concentrated on making each other's stories better? And first that showed in props, and then it showed in the stories that they told. Um, the first game I played in the community was called Just a Little Lovin'. It was three days long. It was in 2011. It was played in Norway, but it was set in uh, upstate New York in a summer house in the Hudson River near Saratoga. And it was a game about love and friendship and desire and about the fear of death. It was set in 82, 83, and 84 in the gay scene at the start of the AIDS epidemic. And it was an incredibly powerful emotional experience. Um, I have lovers who lost a lot of their friends during that time period. This was a game that was very close to my heart in some ways. But playing that and having physically had those experiences changed me in very different ways. I'm not going to claim that I know what it means to have lived through that era now. However, I can say that someone else has used my body to bury their friend of a decade, and having that happen to your body changes you, even if it's not quite you at the time. So, Just the Loving taught things that are much more difficult to teach offline. And I think that Ooh. games are somewhat uniquely placed to teach these things, especially embodied games. It taught solidarity, uh, created, created, taught, these things, are, these things are difficult to draw lines between. We collectively built solidarity with a historical moment. We collectively built a kind of a shared experience and a shared affect that, again, changes you. It's that emotional commitment to struggle that matters much more than all of the intellectual commitment you can have. And I think one of the last things that I want to say here is that play is especially interesting because play is tentative knowledge. Um, so much of especially what kind of MOOCs with the top-down heavy learning concentrates on is, is knowledge that is concrete. Play lets us say, well, maybe this works like this. Does it feel like it works like this? I don't know. I'm going to go take a risk. And we don't get that anywhere else.
So, uh, thank you, Eleanor. Um, you know, in participatory processes, uh, there is always this question, um, open for whom? Uh, yes. Yeah. This, this idea, open for whom? Um, but, you know, let's translate that question into another question. Who are the subjects of this openness? Mm -hmm. um, what processes of uh, inclusion and exclusion take place uh, during this process of becoming a subject of openness, of becoming a user of Facebook, a user of, mm -hmm. of uh, all these tools and, and, and all the, the network? And um, also, um, What's the, the, the turning point in which the subject of openness becomes an object of openness? Because it somehow, it, he or she is somehow performed by all those tools and all those um, instruments. And uh, is that an opportunity? Is that also a fear? Uh, is that... Uh, so I think that? the... I think the subjectivity of openness has to be evaluated very much in a site-specific way. It's different in every specific instance. So with telecomics, anybody who could get on IRC and could find their channel was welcome, and they'd figure out how to bring them in, but you had to get there. You know, and that, that limits to a sphere in certain kinds of ways. With the LARPs, there's a, there's a different thing, and this is the flip side, this is this very Scandinavian flip side of some games are not for everyone, you know, and yes, they, they actively reach out to different and new communities, but there's also a bit of a pushback of like, we want to tell this deep story. You know, we want to, we want to push emotional boundaries. We want, to, we want to do something that brings a historically meaningful moment together. And that means that we need to not even necessarily... I, Curate is a better word, I'd say, than filter, but it's this kind of collective understanding and everyone is ex understood to have a responsibility of like, is this piece of art for me? Should I be here? Um, I think the larger kind of the question of when does, when does subjectivity change to objectivity? When do you become the object of the performance of openness? That's a lot of what I was talking about with the risks of openness, right? Um, my favorite example, briefly, uh, there was some work in India. They were like, well, land records are incredibly convoluted. They're all kept on paper. This is really a huge problem. Let's digitize everything and make it open for everyone. Um, and now, all of a sudden, what happened was, instead of it increasing like land tenure security for poor farmers, it meant that a, a class of people who were basically con men who had access to digital technology, who were already part of that world, moved in and did land swindles en masse. So, yeah, it's, again, the specificity of open for who, for what, when. You know, the flip side is the, the LARP community going out to a bunch of Middle Eastern countries now, uh, starting in Palestine, to say, hey, we've come up with a thing. Do you want to play games with us? We'd like to share and then letting people bring up their own tools and tell their own stories, and, and not letting even, saying, hey, this thing exists. If you want to take it, we would like to help, but you know, it's on you. And now that community is really doing amazing things in a lot of different places, from Ramallah to Gaziantep with um, Syrian refugees in southern Turkey. There's a lot of different ways of kind of that bringing together. And that's the kind of openness which I'm maybe pretty happy about. Thank you. Thank you.